Good evening, everyone. My Bible is open to the 13th Psalm, and I need you to turn your Bible there to Psalm 13. That's where we'll start from as we think about prayer this evening. And as you are turning there and as you're getting settled in, I should most certainly say how pleased I am to be with you this evening. I have really fond memories of being with you in a gospel meeting effort in 2018. In fact, I'm looking forward to being with you again in 2024. Lots of good things have happened in this congregation since then. I'm glad to see growth and to see new Christians and all the good things that are going on here. Really, really excited about talking about prayer. Glad your classes are here. Glad to see some kiddos in here thinking about prayer. What's prayer about? How to do that? How to do that in the best kind of way? Some challenges that come with prayer is where we are tonight. And I, I would I should say this. If you're excited that I'm here this evening, then that's all Brother Danny. We wanted Danny to come and be part of our summer series so much this year at Westside. I'm pulling on him and tugging on him. Hey, you gotta come. We do a summer series on Wednesday nights. You gotta come, you gotta come. Danny said, hey, turnabout's fair play. So if you're glad I'm here, Danny's the one that you need to think about for that. If you're unhappy that I'm here, you should talk to the elders because they have made a poor choice in their speaker selection. How about that? Let's look at the Psalms, please. Can we read in Psalms, Psalm 13? I'm going to read in verse 1, 1, 2, and 3. I'm reading from the English Standard Version tonight. This is Psalm 13, please. How long, O Lord, the psalmist says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord God, lest I light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. David is such an amazing Bible character. Think about him shepherding sheep. Think about him with so much courage stepping out to meet the Philistine bully with nothing but stones and a slingshot. And I think many times when we look at the life of David, we see him maybe as a cut above. He's not like me. But then we come to places like this in the Psalms and, and suddenly David is a lot like us. I'm going to guess that on a Wednesday night if I ask how many people here pray, then I'm going to guess every hand is going to go up. But if I follow that up with the next question and I ask, how many of us have experienced the frustration of unanswered prayer? The same hands will be held. Prayer in Scripture is amazing. It's a great blessing from God. Why then is it that sometimes we beseech the Lord and it seems like, just like the psalmist says, why? Why will you not answer me? Will you forget me forever? Someone says, I'm praying so much for my husband to stop drinking. And he came home drunk again last night. I'm praying for a job. I need a job. And yet I can't seem to find anything. Or how about this? Someone says, I'm praying for my prodigal son to come home from the far country of sin and wild living. He's not moving at all. He's sitting down and seems to be enjoying his wickedness. Why doesn't God do what we ask Him to do? We beseech Him in prayer. What's going on? If we ask and we seek and we knock, isn't it supposed to be opened for us? And I think we all understand, people who are just tremendously carnal and they're praying for God to shower money down upon them, hundred dollar bills please, unmarked, so that I can stuff them in my own pocket. Okay, we get it. We understand why that kind of prayer isn't being answered. But, but what about our prayers? Prayers for somebody who's hurting. Prayers for somebody who's really sick. Prayers for someone the doctors is telling, we don't know what's wrong. We don't know what to do. We're knocking on heaven's door, and it seems like that door will never open. How long must I take counsel in my own soul? A preacher friend of mine told me that he called upon a woman who had lost her husband to cancer. As he sat with her, finally she just blurted out, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and nothing. Ever feel like that? Like you're turning the handle as fast as you can on the prayer machine, but it's not generating anything. Nothing is happening. I am convinced that if we're going to talk about prayer and if we're going to be real, if we're going to be authentic about praying, we need to talk about what happens when our prayers aren't 
answered the way we expected. It seems like there's no answer at all. If we don't talk about that, we, we run the risk of not only being, being in trouble with our praying, but we run the risk that we'll introduce a cancer into our very faith. Sometimes people who pray and don't receive an answer end up questioning the very existence of God or His love and goodness for them, and they end up leaving the Lord. We need to think about what's going on when we just feel like, when we feel like prayer is broken. So this evening, I want us to talk about what we're doing when we say, hey, my prayer, it's not working. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the book of James. James is such a practical, practical book. James is going to help us in an incredible way to better understand prayer. It's so much goes on in the book of James that helps us. And James talks about how prayer can become part of the fabric of our lives and in the best way bring us closer to the Lord. So what I really want to do is just work a little bit out of the book of James this evening and I'm going to work with that from two standpoints. James talks about some things that will mess praying up. And we need to stop off and check with some of that. Sometimes we take some things for granted. We've got some things in play in our lives that are breaking our prayers, and we don't really think enough about that. And then James talks about what makes for the effective kind of praying we want to do. So there's our game plan tonight. Let's just start by thinking a little bit about some of these answers that I really feel like we should know and not forget. And that just starts with this business of doubting. In James chapter 1, pick up with me there in verse 5. If any of you, James 1 and in verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given unto him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person, verse 7, must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, I really wonder sometimes if we're reading that correctly. If you read James 1 there to say, when you ask God for something in prayer, you must absolutely believe with ironclad certainty, no doubt of any kind, God's doing this, I know God's going to do this, I know God's going to answer my prayer. That's how I'm praying. And if you don't pray that way, then pff, you're getting nothing. Do we read it that way sometimes? Maybe, maybe you have felt that your prayers weren't answered. Because you know what? I, I had some doubt. I was praying to God about that. I wasn't really convinced. I wasn't 100% sure. And I want to say to you that while James is certainly talking about doubting here, I want to suggest that if it takes ironclad certainty, 105%, I know God's going to do this, then most of us, yeah, we can quit praying. We can quit praying entirely, can't we? And the Bible really doesn't show that that's what's necessary to do business with God. What about David that I started with in the 13th Psalm? There was a lot of doubt going on there. When are you going to answer me? And David's not the only one that operates in that kind of way. Maybe you remember about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We talk about how faithful they were. Hey, Nebuchadnezzar has them arrested. Going to throw you in the fiery furnace. You're going to be marshmallows in the king's marshmallow roast. What does Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say about that? Yes, they do say, we're not worshiping your idol. We don't even talk to you about that. But then they say, God may deliver. May, may deliver. They don't say, we have absolute certainty that you pitch us in there, we're going to be all good. No, they say, and if God chooses to do that, that'll be just great. But even if He doesn't, we're not worshiping your golden statue. There's not absolute certainty, and there's plenty of that in the Bible. Esther says before she goes to see the king, if I die, I die. Well, what does he mean then? If he's not talking about knowing for certain, oh, this is absolutely the will of God, God will surely do this, what's James pointing to there? Can I show you the other illustration, the other place that he uses the words double-minded? That's in chapter 4. Let's look at chapter 4 and see if we'll notice here what's going on. In chapter 4, there James says, Draw near to God, James 4 verse 8, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
double-minded. We need to add that to the batter of our prayer life as we're baking all of that in. And think about, what does he mean by double-minded? Well, James isn't calling out there the faithful Christian who's seeking God and trying to do God's will, he's beseeching the Lord in prayer. Who's he calling out when he talks in James 4 there about double-mindedness? Double-mindedness there is the person who's, who's half a disciple and half not a disciple. Trying to have a foot in the kingdom and a foot in the world at the same time. You know people like that? And so maybe they get into a jam and they're not absolutely faithful and they're not really convinced that they need to be serving the Lord with 100% of their life. And so what do they do in a jam? You know what? I'm in a really bad situation. I'm going to throw a prayer up. I mean, cover all your bases, right? Couldn't hurt to pray a little bit here. That's what James is talking about in James 4 verse 8. And as you look back to James chapter 1, look at verse 6. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. That person is the double-minded person. The person who needs to clarify his allegiance, whether he's all in the kingdom of God or whether he's going to live all in in the ways of the world. But just using prayer kind of like the fire alarm. I've got no other option here. I guess I'll pull this. I don't even know if it really works, but I'm going to try this. James says, yeah, that'll mess your praying up. That'll mess your praying up. And maybe I should add to that what he says in verse 12. Blessed is the man, blessed is the man, verse 12, who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he'll receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Sometimes... Sometimes we come to believe that prayer is designed to cure all emotional turmoil. That if I just pray hard enough, if I just pray enough, then I will always be up. I'll never have those emotional blues. I'm never going to be a downer. I'm always just going to know victory in Jesus. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about? I'm just going to have that mesmerizing glow about me all the time. And while we very easily call out the gospel of health and wealth and this idea that God's going to rain cash money down upon you. I think sometimes we struggle a little bit with the idea about emotional turmoil. Maybe I would call this the gospel of emotional health. That if I'm faithful enough, if I serve God hard enough, and especially if I just pray enough, then being depressed, having depression, being down, oh, I would never know any of those kinds of things. I could always just be smiling and happy and, like I said, just going to know victory in Jesus all the time. Is that what James 1.12 sounds like? James 1.12 doesn't say, pray and all the difficulties go away. James 1.12 says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. The man who's praying for strength to cope with the trial, because the trial isn't going away. In fact, in context, if we move back up in the passage to chapter 1 and verse 3, you need to know, how about verse 2? Count it all joy, my brothers, James 1 verse 2, when you meet trials of various kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let steadfastness have its full effect so that you'll be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And then now verse 5, if you lack wisdom, wisdom what? Wisdom to cope with this difficulty. You ask God. And God will bless you with that wisdom. But James 1 doesn't say anywhere, just pray enough and you'll feel better. You'll have sunshine all around you. Even if it's raining everywhere else, you'll just be that happy Christian because you know how to pray. That's not part of the prayer equation. And then maybe I should add what James says here in James chapter 4. If we ask for the wrong reasons, that will most assuredly foul up praying. In James 4, look at verse 3. James says there, You ask and you don't receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Here's the verse that nobody seems to be very interested in when we start talking about prayers not getting where we want them to go. God didn't answer my prayer. I didn't get what I asked for. What about James 4.3? Eh, we back away from that passage, but this is the passage in Scripture that most clearly addresses why prayer might not be working. And what James says here in James 4.3 is the problem is not prayer. The problem is the prayer. 
The Indian is the issue, not the arrow here. We're not doing the right thing with what we're shooting. We're all about ourselves. We're asking for selfish purposes. Maybe I should just be completely candid about all of this. It's time for us to say, prayer is not about how I can enrich myself more, how I can get out of God all the niceties of life that I want. But honestly, isn't that what people want to use prayer for? And in fact, if somebody writes a new book on prayer, or they've got a new podcast on prayer, and they're talking about how they have figured this out, they have this new formula, this new way to make sure that God gives you what you want. We all rush to that. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why are we so interested in all these charlatans who basically are telling us little more than their recipe for how to rub the magic lamp harder, make the genie appear faster, and give us more than three wishes? Is that what prayer is about? James says if that's what prayer is about for you, you're making a huge mistake. I'm going to guess that most of us guys have been in a situation where we need to do some hammering and we didn't have our hammer right there just real handy, you know what I'm talking about? And what do we do? That's right, screwdriver handles. They make terrible hammers. But all of us have tried at some point to what? Yeah. And when you do that, you usually end up bending the nail and tearing up the handle of the screwdriver. Please do not check my toolbox. I have screwdrivers that have all kinds of divots and chips out of them because I'm banging away. It's the wrong tool for the job. And if somebody writes a book on how to use your screwdriver like a hammer, I'm not buying the book. And James tells us, when we try to turn prayer into our own selfish agenda, it's the wrong tool for the job. If it's all about you and getting more and what I want and I need and Lord get busy chop chop because I want you to deliver my wish list, then James says what we are is carnal and a spiritual tool won't fit carnal purpose. So I think that's helpful to think about and to work with and to better understand Some things that could go wrong. Maybe what we really ought to talk about then is, hey, what could go right? And that's in James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, if you'll read with me in verse 16. In James chapter 5, in James chapter 5 and verse 16. Danny, how do you preach up here? There are three remotes. I am not making this up. There is stuff everywhere up here. Look, there's more. Dana, pull my eBay account up. I'm going to sell this one. Wow, there's a lot of stuff going on up here. A minute ago I thought, pick a remote, Mark, and hope it changes. And Yahtzee. My prayers have been answered. Let's look at James 5. It's James 5 and verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. So James here says something about what makes prayer go. And what he says makes it go is a character of heart. The righteous person. In fact, he has an example of that. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on this earth. He prayed again. Heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Lots to learn there. We drill into that passage and begin to mine out what's going on. I can assure you it will help your prayer life significantly. Because what we want to think about is what does it mean to be a righteous man? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm not going into some kind of Greek textual study. You don't need to know the Greek word behind that. You know what a righteous man is? Of course you know what a righteous man is. righteous man is a man who's trying to do what's right. That's all there is to that. A man who wants to do the will of God. Elijah's the illustration of that. He's a man who wanted to do God's will. And when a person wants to do God's will, that just transforms, James says, how they pray, what they pray for, and what prayer does. So for example, I got the right remote here. For example, prayer and a righteous man is always going to be concerned about sin. 
That's what's going to be at the top of the prayer list. And I know that because of how James begins this. Look at verse 13. Let's just stay in the context. In James chapter, thir- James chapter 13, good luck. Everybody who got James 13, that's, that's probably not a great Bible you're holding there. But if you have James 5.13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick. The Lord will raise him up. He's committed sins. He'll be forgiven. Now that's one of those passages that just causes everything to stop. What do you mean about anointing oil? What do we do in there? Call for somebody? You ever been anointed? Ever ever thought, hey, I'll call the shepherds here. They'll bring some oil out. Maybe a little Pennzoil 10W. That'll be great. Just get some anointing going. What are we doing with that? Well, there's a number of options there. It's a difficult passage. May just be talking about, may just be talking about medicine. Luke chapter 10, the good Samaritan, the man in the ditch, what's he do? He anoints his wounds with oil. It might just mean that you get ready to go about the things of daily life. In Daniel, he anoints himself with oil. That's part of his morning routine to get himself ready to go out, be in public and so forth. So the idea would be this person is sick and then we're going to get them ready because they're going to get well. God's going to bless them. And, And so if you pray for rain, you carry an umbrella. You understand what James is saying there? That may be what's working there. But whatever we want to make of that, what you still have to see is the emphasis that James puts is on sin. Verse 15, if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. That's where James is going. Sin is what matters. More than even being physically ill. What matters to God is our walk with Him and sin breaks that and destroys that. It messes up our relationship with God. So sin needs to be the central concern of our praying. Can I ask you if your sin is the central concern of your prayer? At the top of your prayer list? Sometimes all sin gets in our praying is a cliche. God forgive us of all of our many sins that we have committed against thee since the last time that we sought thee for pardon. It's all one word. You've heard that prayer? Yeah, I've prayed that prayer. Where is brokenheartedness? Where is confession? Confession means to speak the same thing. When do we say to God what God says about our sins? This was wrong. There is no excuse for it. I have have fallen into this again. I am totally responsible. I chose to rebel against you, Father. I have sinned. Where's that kind of prayer? James says, righteous people care about sin. It's not ho-hum, I sin, you sin. You know, we're all just human, so sin's not a big deal. To James, sin is a huge deal. Here's the big question. You don't get anything else out of this lesson. You should have listened more carefully. But I'd like for you to at least take this home with you. You need to ask yourself, where is confessing, repenting, turning to God, weeping, lamenting my sin? Where is that fitting in my daily prayer life? And I would add to that, James would add to that, this business of knowing that God's ways are best. That's this business with Elijah. Note that again in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I need to be careful here that I don't set Elijah up on a pedestal make him so unique in his praying and righteousness that all of us step back and say, boy, I could never be like that. That would be that would be the exact opposite of what James wants us to do. The purpose of citing Elijah is not to say, look at him, I can't be like that. The purpose of citing Elijah is to say, yes, he was just an ordinary person. He had a nature like ours, but he did some incredible things in prayer because he trusted in God's way. He really did pray that it would not rain, verse 17. And for three years and six months, it didn't rain. Now, here's the question. Why did Elijah pray like that? Why did Elijah say, let's have no rain? He didn't do that because he was the local weatherman and he wanted to get the forecast correct 
for three and a half years. Chance of rain tomorrow, absolutely zero. Everybody's like, Elijah, what a meteorologist. This guy, how does he know? No, no, that's not why Elijah said it's not going to rain. Do you know why Elijah said it's not going to rain? Because he knew his Bible. He knew his Bible. Look with me in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses preaches, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses preaches four sermons before he is to die. And these sermons admonish the people of God, the Israelites, about how they are to act and behave in the land of Canaan. And Moses tells them very clearly in a section of Deuteronomy, I'm in Deuteronomy the 28th chapter, that there will be tremendous blessings if they are obedient. And then there will be awful curses if they are not. Verse 15, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 28, 15, if you'll not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And then Moses begins to list terrible things that will happen. And that includes, look at verse 23. And the heavens over your head shall be bronze, and the earth under you shall be iron. Well, if there's any passage, Texans ought to understand we get it, don't we? We know what that looks like. We know what that feels like. The Lord, verse 24, will make the rain of your land powder. From heaven dust shall come down upon you until you are destroyed. You know why Elijah prayed it wouldn't rain? Because that's what God said He would do when His people refused to worship and serve Him with all their heart. When they broke covenant with their God, this, this is what's going to happen. The people were in sin, and Elijah prayed, are you ready for this? He prayed that they would be punished for their sin. That's a big time praying right there. You ever prayed for that? Ever prayed? We need to take sin more seriously. That's what Elijah's praying. Oh Lord, we need to be right with You. Our people have gone away from You, so we need to reap what we've sown. We need You, God, to do what Moses, Your servant, said You would do when we have forsaken and forgotten You. Lord, I am praying You will bring the curses of Deuteronomy upon these people people. We need to know the pain and the hurt of sinful living because God, I know that's the way your people will return to you. That's what Elijah's praying here. And you should understand and I should understand that Elijah absolutely knew how painful that would be for the land of Israel. This is an agricultural economy. When it doesn't rain, people don't eat. When people don't eat, they don't have any money to sell crops. They don't go to the shops and buy everybody suffers. And during that three and a half years, everybody suffers, including Elijah. He has trouble eating until God providentially and miraculously feeds him. You think Elijah didn't know what was going to happen if it didn't rain for three and a half years? Elijah knew that that would be a cataclysmic disaster, but he prays this way because there was a cataclysmic spiritual disaster going on. He prays that God will do what God has promised He would do to bring people back to Him. Lord, soften our hearts by this terrible circumstance of famine and drought. People will turn back to You. That's what He's all about. People, The people were spiritual adulterers. To use the language of Hosea, to use the language of the prophets, to use the language of James in the New Testament. They had turned away from God. And Elijah trusted. He trusted in God's way and God's will. And here, instead of praying for just anything willy-nilly and then adding that caveat on the back end, if it be thy will, no, what Elijah says is, let's find out what is God's will and we'll pray for God to do just that. Now read that James passage again. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. James 5.17 He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain upon the earth. He prayed again. And the heavens gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. When did he pray? After that amazing contest on Mount Carmel? When he exposed 
fraudulent priest of Baal. And when he pulled the people of Israel's hearts back to God, then Elijah said, O Lord, bless us. You got these people's attention. Your ways are best. I trust you, God, to do what's best. James uses an illustration of prayer. He talks about a time that prayer absolutely worked in a phenomenal kind of way because this man was praying in the will of God, which means that he absolutely understood that prayer is about conforming his life to the will of God. Why doesn't Elijah pray that he be teleported miraculously to a beach in Hawaii where the surfing is really great and there's no Queen Jezebel trying to remove his head from his neck? That seems like a good thing to pray for. Elijah doesn't pray about that at all. It doesn't seem that Elijah is praying for himself or talking about himself, or filling his prayer full of personal requests. What Elijah's about is the will of God. He's all about God's will. And I am certain that sometimes when I would say, if I could say to James, or if I could say to Elijah, hey, I'm cranking the handle, and the prayer machine seems like it's broken, what they would say is, Mark, you're praying about the wrong thing. You're not trusting in God's will. You're not concerned about sin. And you're not trying to conform yourself to God's will. You're not saying to God, Thy will be done. You're saying to God, My will be done. Remember what I said a minute ago about using a screwdriver for a hammer? It's just a terrible tool for a hammer. I need to say to you tonight that prayer, if you're trying to use it as a crowbar, you're going to lever out of God what you want. It is a terrible tool for that. And such attempts only say that we have sadly misunderstood what prayer is all about. Prayer should be a way for us to talk to God. And as a result of that conversation with God, we can draw closer to Him as we pray and think through, God, what's your will? God, what do you want me to do in this situation? God, what have you said in your word? I want to know your will. Then I'm going to pray your will and I'm going to do your will. Maybe this is a fair time then to say something about asking God in prayer. And I don't want anybody to expect or to say out of any of this to, to think in any way. We can't ask. There is asking in Scripture. In our daily Bible reading program at Westside, we just got done reading about Hezekiah terribly sick. Isaiah 38th chapter. And Isaiah says, you're going to die. Well, thank you for that encouraging word, Isaiah. zippity doo dah for you too. Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and he asks. He asks God for longer life. There's a place. There is a place for asking. I understand that. Requesting can be part of our praying. But sometimes it dominates our praying. It just takes it over. It's the sum total almost of our praying, except for a few cliches that we throw out to try to say something about a few other things like sin or missionaries the world over or bless our brethren or something. But mostly it's about me and what I want. The point that I'm working with you is the more we understand about prayer, particularly from James, is the more we come to understand that what we want to ask for ought to be shaped and guided by an understanding of what God wants to give us. We ought to be asking, what is God's will? We ought to be pushing ourselves to try to conform to God's will. So I said something about being out of a job. Here's somebody who's praying, Lord, I need a job and I'm looking for a position with a six-figure income. That's one way to pray. Here's somebody who's praying, Lord, I need a job to support my family. I know it's your will, Lord, that if a man doesn't work, he won't eat. I want to work. I want to support my family. I want to give to the kingdom. I want to give to those who are oppressed and who are in need. Lord, 
I need a job to generate the income so that I can do your will. That's a totally different prayer. Isn't it? That man will go out looking for a job and see the job opportunities in a completely different way than someone who is haughtily and arrogantly announcing to God, I want a six-figure income. Because one man is about himself, and how can I use God to get what I want? And one man is about the will of God, and how can I do God's will? You should know. It's not just James that talks like that. In John 15, the Master, the one who prayed like no one else ever had, the one who teaches us so much about prayer says this, in John 15, in John 15 and verse 7, there Jesus said, If you abide in Me, and My words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Sometimes we just land on the end of the verse. Ask whatever. And we completely failed to see the beginning of the verse. When God's Word abides in us, changes what we ask for. Sometimes in daily Bible reading, I talk with people about not checking boxes on a schedule, but instead thinking about daily Bible reading as the opportunity to spend time with God. I need to hear from the Lord. That's half of this communication loop. God speaks to us through His Word. I want to know God's will. Instead of saying, i got to get my Bible reading done today, I need to spend time with the Lord. And you know what? That works for the other half of the communication loop too, doesn't it? Instead of saying, oh, I haven't prayed today. Better catch up on my praying. How about this? I need to spend time with God. I want to talk to God. I want to be thankful for the amazing ways that He blesses me. I want to pour out my heart in intercession for others. I need to confess and turn away from sin. And yes, there are some things that I want to ask God if He's willing and if it's in His will to bless me with so that I can do His will. I want to spend time with God. I need to spend time in prayer. That, it seems to me, to be at the heart of what Jesus says in John 15 and is absolutely at the heart of what James is saying about Elijah and the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Now, without any question, James most certainly has not answered every question that we have about unanswered prayer. And I have not answered nor can I answer every question about it. Somewhere in all of that, I began with the story of the woman who was so disappointed that her husband had passed away from sin. I prayed and I prayed and nothing. But what did she pray for? Did she pray for strength to support her husband in this terrible physical trial? Did she pray for faith to accept God's will no matter what? Did she pray that she would have the courage to be an example of other, to others as she faced this severe trial that our hope is not in this life, but in the life to come? Or did somehow she imagine that because she's a Christian, God rolls the red carpet out in front of her and her husband, and they are now immune to every sickness and every disease, and I guess we'll live until the Lord comes back. Because you know, I'm cranking the handle on the prayer machine. God forbid. And it's James that helps us better see what prayer is not about and what prayer is absolutely about as we build into our lives and hearts the character of righteousness concerned about what God is concerned about, sin, concerned about trusting Him to do what's best, and most of all, 
trying to conform myself to the image of His Son so that I can do His will. That's the prayer that God is always ready to answer yes. Let's pray about that. Would you pray with me, please? Oh, Lord our God, we are awed that You pay attention to us. We are specks on the back of a speck in this giant universe. But You care about us. You sent Your Son for us. And we have this amazing avenue of prayer that we can talk with You and come to know You and pour our hearts before You. We ask God that You would bless us with the words of James. Help James 5 to shape our praying. We want to know Your will. We want to honor and please You. And we ask, Father, that You defeat our foolish prayers that ask for the wrong thing. And that You bless us when we seek to exalt and honor You. Give us the strength to do what's right. Give us the wisdom to know what's right. But Father, bless us in our praying that we will ask for what is right. It's in Your Son's name that we pray. And Amen. Does anyone need a remote? I have extras. <laughs>